This is Devin Sheets with Alpha Sound. Let's talk about reverb. Reverb is something we all use but don't talk about in depth very much. I want to show you the differences between at least four categories of reverbs that you'll probably encounter, and then go into some detail about my favorite, the impulse response convolution reverb. So the first type of reverb is natural acoustic reverb, the kind you hear in real spaces like this. Now unfortunately you don't have a lot of control over that type of reverb. You can try to reposition the stage and the speakers and the audience a little bit in the room. Maybe you can rent pipe and drape and put it along the walls to reduce the reverb. Uh, if you want to extend it, you can use something like Yamaha's AFC technology, which uses tiny microphones and speakers all around the space to re-amplify the natural sound back into it. A second type of reverb comes from acoustic devices, such as a spring or metal plate. The device becomes energized with the input sound, and the sound is propagated throughout the device and re-emitted, having taken on some unique sonic stamp or characteristic. A third type of reverb is digital reverb, which uses a mathematical algorithm to place a unique sonic stamp or characteristic on the input sound. So much like how the second type works, this is a mathematical device. The math equations that govern the final sound can either be tailored to resemble real and recognizable acoustic spaces or devices as much as possible, or they can be warped and twisted into all sorts of interesting and crazy patterns. Now, one problem with algorithm-based reverbs is that they can sound grainy and metallic, especially in the high frequencies. And so, a fourth type of reverb is the digital convolution method, which seeks to take a recording of a real acoustic space and make a sort of digital snapshot or imprint called an impulse response, which can be used to shape an input sound such that the resulting sound is as if the input sound had really been recorded in the real acoustic space. The process of applying the imprint to the input sound is called convolution. To understand how this method works, imagine a bat using sonar to scan the shape of a room. The bat emits a sound which goes out into the environment and bounces around and ultimately comes back to the bat's ears. The sound that comes back has the imprint or sonic stamp of the room and the bat knows how to interpret the sound to tell how big and what shape the room is. Now if we could use microphones to record the sound of a single bat screeching one time into a room, we could use that audio file as an impulse response for our reverb. The software would take the incoming audio signals, like a percussion track, and break the sound up into tiny little bits, and then take each bit and stretch it out over the impulse response file until they all take that shape and then recombine or convolve all the newly formed audio bits in order again so that the drum sounds like it was in the room just like the bat. However, not only will the drum take on the characteristics of the room from the impulse response file, it'll also take on the characteristic of the sound that was emitted into the room in the first place. In this case, since the screeching sound from the bat is very high-pitched and doesn't contain any other frequency ranges, the reverb software won't know what to do with all the other frequencies in the drum sound. It'll just apply the reverb to the frequencies it knows about from the impulse response file, and you'll get a roomy sounding snare drum reverb that actually kind of sounds like a bat screech, oddly enough. So when you're making an impulse response of a room, which you can do with something like Logic's impulse response utility, you need to use a device to emit the sound impulse that has a wide and neutral frequency response. Lots of people have used gunshots or balloon pops or clapping or even speakers bursting out white noise. These are okay but still have some characteristics of their own.
There is also a completely different method which involves a sine wave sweep through the speaker system in the room. If this method is used, the software knows to take the recorded impulse response and time stretch it per frequency so that the beginning points of all the frequencies in the sweep line up with each other and sound like one big burst of noise again. This is probably the best method. It's also important to understand that the location in the room of both the sound impulse device and the microphones used to record can greatly affect the sound of the reverb. If the microphones are really close to the sound impulse, their reverb will have a lot more direct sound from the snare drum in this case. And if the microphones are far away from the sound impulse, their reverb will be much more ambient and detached. If you want a really ambient sound to the reverb but can't get the microphones far enough away from the sound impulse device, you can edit the impulse response audio file later by cutting off the beginning so that the sound starts just after the burst. Also, sometimes certain rooms sound great in a particular frequency range, but not in others. You can mix impulse responses from different rooms, crossing them over with each other so that the mid-range might have the sound of one space, but the high frequency has the sound of another. This is great for a vocal reverb where you might want the sibilance to have a longer reverb tail than the mid-range. Or maybe for an interesting orchestral or choral reverb, you want it to get darker as time goes on, so you can automate an EQ filter and apply it to the impulse response file. The possibilities here are endless. You can also have multiple sound impulse devices and multiple microphones throughout the room and record them individually or in groups, really in any combination you want, so that you can get some spatial imaging within the reverb, depending on the stereo or even surround sound panning that you're doing with the snare drum or whatever in the mix. Now, impurities in the impulse response recording can sound really strange. If you're doing the noise burst method and say somebody coughs during the recording, your snare drum reverb will have a kind of coughing sound in the background. <coughs> What's even worse is if you cough during the sine wave sweep method, because when the file gets time stretched per frequency, depending on which direction you ran the sweep, the coughing sound in the reverb will actually be sweeping up and down in pitch the whole time. So it's really important that you have a very silent environment when you make an impulse response, and that your sound impulse device is full range and really neutral. Unless, of course, you want the reverb to also take on the characteristics of the sound impulse device, like our bat screech from earlier. Or what if I just use the sound of my voice as an impulse response file? Check. Remember that all the traditional aspects of reverb manipulation also apply to impulse responses. Adding a bit of silence to the beginning of the file creates what is normally called initial delay in reverb settings. When a sound is emitted into a real space, it takes some time for the sound to travel outward before it hits the walls and starts bouncing back and around to create the reverb effect. The larger the room, the longer it takes. And so adding more initial delay can create a sense that the space is even larger, perhaps, than the actual sound of the reverb itself would suggest.
Now here's a few other tips about using these reverbs in live sound settings. Reverbs with a lot of direct sound in the impulse response file can be susceptible to feedback in speaker systems. Because feedback is when the same sound gets reamplified through the speakers and microphones over and over again without much change. If the reverb is more ambient, the frequencies are altered enough so that when they get picked up again through the sound system, they have a harder time forming a loop after that point. Also, if you're using surround sound effects for a larger audience, be aware that people who are sitting closer to one of the surround speakers might hear a lot more reverb than anything else, and there could be a significant time delay between what they hear in that speaker and what they hear from the main speakers way up front. So I choose a reverb that is generally very ambient, or at least ambient in the surround channels when I'm mixing for larger audiences. However, in some situations, I actually do use surround reverbs that have a strong direct image and a very short reverb tail. Because let's say that I want to spread the snare drum around the audience. If I just take the raw sound from the snare mic and pump it through all the surround channels, there could be all sorts of strange phasing issues in the audience, which is a particular problem with sounds that are exactly the same piped through different speakers. Using a very short reverb can add just enough variance to the sound in the different surround speakers that most of the phasing effect can be avoided without adding too much noticeable reverb as an effect. I even use short surround sound reverbs as processing for my master outs from the console at some events so that everything goes through them and that way nothing ever sounds out of place because everything the audience heard all night had that characteristic and as far as I know it's just the sound of the venue. Another really cool trick, if you can manage it, is to use the sound system in the venue as a sound impulse device to create your own impulse response of the very room that you're in. Then, if you want, you can go into the impulse response file and stretch it out in time a little more using something like Logic's flex time tool, and then use that as your reverb for the show so it blends with the space really well. Anyway, thanks for watching this video, and please share it with your friends and like my page. And I'll leave you with a couple of samples of a reverb that I've spent the last 10 years tweaking on. I use it for choral and orchestral applications because it is extremely smooth and natural sounding, and I just really like it. Enjoy.